Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my loyal co-host, the smart one, the cute one, the nice one, Michael Walker. How are you doing? The eye candy baby. Yeah. I'm doing good, Mark. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks. I am filled with joy and love for the people of Iceland, Malta, and South Africa. Yes, I saw this message. It was I was very uplifted by this this whole... Apparently, according to some tracker that may or may not have any good information, That's... we are the number one hobby... That sent us information for no particular reason. In Iceland, Malta, and South Africa, I've actually spoken with fans in both Iceland and Malta. I haven't spoken to anybody from South Africa, so sound off if you're from South Africa. But I have to say, Portugal and Estonia, shape up. We're apparently only the the number two hobby podcast in Portugal and Estonia. We're slipping. Who are these people? What, the Yarniacs? Is that what they're listening to? (laughs) Some needlepoint thing? Or Come on. Not okay. All you people in Portugal and Estonia, come on. Think about your life. Think about your choices. Put those needles down. So, we are going to be talking about the game we reviewed last year in the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, the Eurus. We're going to talk about the games we played last week, the news, and why it doesn't matter. And finally, our topic this week is going to be about dungeon crawlers. So, Walker, what did we review last year? Last year, Mark reviewed a game called Batman Gotham City Chronicles. It was one of these giant kickstarting buckets of plastic games that had a rule book that could knock a horse unconscious. <laughs> well, it would definitely confuse a horse. What with all the strange sectioning decisions and some rules repeated three times when you didn't need them and some important rules mentioned once in passing in some Obscure irrelevant part of the book, se- section. Yes. yes. And they said there was going to be a second edition rule book. I looked into it, I think it was two or three months ago. They did have like a second Kickstarter, and I'm waiting to find out when this V2 rule book is going to be ready. I have kept the game, much like Reichbusters, in anticipation for this <laughs> updated rule book so we can revisit this game. What's this we? Does this we include me? I'm because have, Yeah, I'm forcing you to play it again. I have not played it since we reviewed it. I'm, I'd very, I'm, I'm pretty happy about it, to be frank. <laughs> and, and I'm... I, no, look, there was one cool thing about it. Sometimes, sometimes swinging from cover to cover at high altitudes felt awfully batman And the rest of it, I could take or leave and mostly leave. But this being said, it had the very interesting mechanic like we just talked about with uh, Civilization New Dawn and Conan and such things. The river activation. The river activation. You're sliding things down this track. You can activate the thing at the bottom for free, or if you want to activate the same, and then it it slides to the end. And if you want to use stuff near the end, it's going to cost you more points or some sort of penalty. And I find that interesting. Sure. Batman Gotham City Chronicles is an example of what you would call a BFG, or a big French game. And it was designed by Frédéric Henry and put up by Monolith. When the second edition rulebook comes out, don't let me know about it. No problem. I'll just, I won't let you know. I'll just have it all set up and ready for you when you get here. Oh, no. So, Mark, that was the game we reviewed exactly to the second one year ago. What did you play this week? I get to play By Stealth and Sea. This was a review copy sent to us by DVG Games. This is by Nicola Sagini and David Thompson. I love me some David Thompson. A week without David Thompson is a mistake. This is a solo war game about the Decima Flotiglia MAS, which is a particular branch of the naval services of the Italian army during the Second World War that basically had... It's tough to describe. They wrote these things called SLCs, which were essentially, imagine a tiny, tiny, tiny submarine or a relatively large torpedo that two men in frog gear would ride all the way to the target and then detach and attach a limpet mine to it. This was a, a novel technique and certainly is is very different from any form of naval warfare that I'm familiar with, not that I'm an expert on the topic. And the solo implementation, as put up by Nicholas Seguini and David Thompson, is kind of like Can't Stop for the War Game set. And I don't know whether I mean that purely as a compliment or, or sort of as a damning with faint praise, because it's a very simple game, very quick, tinged with historical flavor, as you would expect all historical war games to be. And it's basically a se- series of, of suffering a series of small fires. Every round, you suffer a series of malfunctions in your technology. These torpedoes apparently were not very well designed, or at the very least were sufficiently novel. I don't want to insult any engineers that were involved in the process, but now your breathing apparatus fails to work, and now the ballast doesn't work, and now the battery doesn't work. And you always have this question of, do I try to spend some time to repair this thing while patrol boats are trying to find me, or do I press on and accept that I'll be operating at reduced capacity? And balancing that across the activation system, 
the the rules look a, a lot more daunting than they are. And in fact, you have a summary card, a player help card, that summarizes all the many, many actions available to you. And you can do it with two actions, in which case it's guaranteed success in most instances. Or you can spend one action, and you might have a 50% chance of it succeeding, or a 33% chance of it succeeding, or what have you, case depending. But in point of fact, the actual actions are a breeze. It's very simple. Mostly it's about movement and trying to submerge, and then when you actually get to your target, it's a series of high-stakes rolls to try to detach the explosive and then detonate the thing so you can sink a ship. I really enjoyed it, but purely as a press-your-luck exercise with some kind of emergent narrative coming up the back end. It's like, oh, I this is the name of the British warship that I failed to sink, and this is the name of the sailors that got captured by the British Navy because they were just piddling around with a, a piece of tech that didn't work in the middle of a harbor for the military. It's exquisitely researched, as um, many David Thompson games are. You can download the companion book that is full of information about all the men who were involved in these operations, so it would probably arouse your uh, objection to, you know, pictures of actual humans, including some of their biography in an actual war game. It's neat. It's nice. I like the press your luck element. I like trying to decide whether I should just soldier on with bad tech or take the time and see if I can I, I can afford the risk and then diving so the patrol boat doesn't know where I am anymore. It's very simple, very accessible. I've played a couple times without the campaign rules, but just standalone historical scenarios. And yes, your technology gets better. That mostly means that it fails slightly less often. <laughs> it's just a deluge of malfunctions. Yeah, so it's malfunction the game, or can't stop for the war game set. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's not as ambitious as a lot of other David Thompson designs, but that's fine. It doesn't have to be. And it, again, has a very, very simple execution system for the different technologies and approaches that the your opposition, namely the British Navy, seek to deploy against you. They try to find you with searchlights. They deploy patrol boats. And again, initially, it's, it's somewhat daunting. But unlike some of my criticisms of his past designs, where I look at the back of a player aid card and say, but there should be information that I need here... Everything here is on the board or on player aid cards. It's it's so incredibly simple to execute. There's only one exception, and that's the escape procedure. Once you've actually blown up a ship, your your crew members try to escape. And for that, you have to check the rule book. And in point of fact, on the player aid card that is single-sided, under the escape action says, this is a special action, check the rule book. And so I'm like, you couldn't get it all the way there. But it's so close. Marvelously usable, very flavorful, again, an understudied period of history or an understudied ser series of engagements. As far as World War II is concerned, very much like Castle Itter, a little bit like Pavlov's House for in the West, in the East, it's very well studied, and very much like Soldiers and Postmen's uniforms, which is uh, going to be released soon by DVG. So I liked myself and see it was very good, very quick, very approachable. And if you're at all interested in the topic, which is a very, very interesting topic, I thoroughly recommend it. By Stealth and Sea. You know, I got to play a game today by the Sadler Brothers called Alter Quest, where they altered the way people quest in Dungeon. No, it's a it's 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 a, it's a homophone. It's, it's spelled different. It's I know, I know. Do you know? No, not really. It's okay. published by Blacklist Games. So this is you know the Sadler Brothers' twist on on dungeon crawling. I'm not sure, Mark. I'm not sure what to say. I want to play it more. I think I was. Do I you know, really? I do. I think I was skewed by the. By the mission that we were given, I just thought I think it was a little bit wonky. Much like my very first game of of uh, Sentinels Multiverse was, you know, against the Plague Rat. My oh. first my first game of Alter Quest was also against the Plague Rat, right? And you know how the Plague Rat goes; it's very, very uh, mechanical. And I think this one was more mechanical than the than the other scenarios. You know, with a lot of you know sicknesses and cards and and things to do. It just seemed like a lot of busy work to me. I have bad news for you, Walker. Uh oh. The other scenarios I've played have been a little bit more in depth and intricate in terms of how they're executed. Because this is one of the strengths of the modular deck system that the Sadler Brothers have invented. This is the third modular deck system game. The first being Street Masters, the second being Brook City, and now Ultra Quest. It's going to be followed later on by Hour of Need, the superhero ish version. And it's weird because. Despite having the same bones as those other two games, Ultra Quest feels very, very different. It feels like its own beast. For one thing, there's the issue of what scenario you're doing, what quest you're doing. And very much like the case decks in Brook City, different quests have very different conceptions of what the victory conditions are going to look like. 
Whereas in Brook City, I felt that the cases, in conjunction with the crime decks, introduced far too many global modifiers and far too many weird conditionals and strange board-wide effects. The quests that I've encountered so far in Ultra Quest, and I have now played four times in the week since I got it, which I think should be an indication of my enthusiasm, despite my misgivings, which I'll give voice to in a moment. The quests feel very different, while at the same time offering the same basic structure. So it's somewhere between Brook City's very, very finely tuned specificity and Street Master's generality of all qual- all the quests are the same, insert fist into boss's face. Which is fine, it's not a criticism of Street Master's, but it's much more straightforward in nature. The one that we had today, for example, was you needed to find eight rooms and then suffer a bad things card in order to ping the eight features. In compared to some of the other ones, that's much, much more straightforward. Now, some of the other ones were things like, well, in four different rooms, ping a specific card, which will then tell you to do a certain thing in order to activate these other dice, which will then trigger a quest effect. And then when you do that, go back to the stairs. It's strange. A lot of people have, have responded to Ultra Quest negatively on the basis of upkeep in terms of modifying things. Maybe it's because Brook City kind of recalibrated my expectations of what you might be expected to do in terms of overhead. But I find Ultra Quest marvelously straightforward, given the degree of variety involved. And part of that is because they've done a very, very good job of making sure that managing the AI, and by the AI, I'm not just including the enemies, I'm including everything, is very, very simple. In, even in the game of Street Masters, I find it tiresome to have to look over everyone's shoulders and make sure they're doing things properly. In Ultra Quest, I can run the entire system and it doesn't feel like any strain at all. And in terms of time management, most of the focus is where it should be. Namely, most of the focus is on the player actions. So let's talk about the length of the game then. <laughs> well, that, well you, that segue was perfect. Players act, player actions and the length of the game. Because a lot of the time, the, the length of someone's turn was longer than it took them to do the actions. Like they could, well, I'm going to exhaust this and that will let me use this and I do this and, and then I do that. And then like, oh, I haven't used any of my actions yet. So I have, they haven't actually really started their turn and they've already been like 10 minutes in. Ten minutes is an exaggeration. I, it, well, it's a complete exaggeration, but that was just trying to show my. <laughs> so we played a three-player game. It was Huey, yourself, and me. It was my fourth game. It was Huey's second game. It was your first game. Explanation, setup, teardown took two and a half hours, which is long, probably a little bit longer than it should be. With two players, when it, we were just discovering the game for the first time, it was two hours. Setup, explanation, teardown. Playing solo, I can knock out a game in about an hour. And I think that demonstrates that it's really mostly about the player turns that are taking a lot of the time. Unlike Street Masters, you're not constantly drowning in new mobs coming in, and so you have to activate four mobs at the end of every turn. In fact, it's very figure light, all told. There's hardly any enemies on the board at any given time, and so managing that is relatively trivial. And when all our actions are done, you activate the threat areas, you activate the quest deck, you activate the villain deck, and then you're done. And I was usually, most of the time when playing Ultra Quest, and again, this is because I've been trained by Brook City and Street Masters, thinking I must be missing something, because that didn't take any time at all. And in all, both of those other games, I'm used to them, it's like, alright, we've done all our actions, let's do everything else now. And it's tedious and exhausting. But in Ultra Quest, one of my key appreciations of it is despite the level of detail, despite the level of specificity of the scenarios, and the variety in the enemy types... Managing all the systems is a breeze. Most of the effort, and this is a question of whether or not you'll enjoy this kind of thing, is managing, as Walker said, your endless series of combos. Tap this to do that, draw this card, play this card. Oh, that didn't cost an action move. That does cost an action. Track that over here. I wouldn't call it busy work. I would just say that it's a demanding system whereby in order to succeed, you're going to have to manage a lot of different information. But the information load is handled properly. It's all about your character. It's all about what they're doing. I agree. And I just, I thought, I was, I'm just looking, I was looking for more of a story. I didn't, I don't know if it was just skipped over because some people don't like the exposition or whatever, but it just didn't seem as though, it just didn't, it didn't seem why we're there, mate. It didn't sh- show itself in the game. And those, this that's will come absolutely up, true. This will come up later in, you know, what makes up, you know, a dungeon crawler, right? I didn't know it. And I think that's an essential part of most dungeon crawlers, right? Is the story and why you go into a room. Really? For me. Wow. I'm just saying. And it just sort of brings you into the game. But we'll talk about more of this later. It's, it's weird because I felt that Ultra Quest gives you hardly any narrative context. That's but at the same thinking. time, I feel like it gives you more narrative context than most dungeon crawlers. Most dungeon crawlers are something, something, kick down a door and kill things. In our session of Ultra Quest, it was something, something, there's a plague, kick down a door and wipe out the plague. 
which already is a little bit more specific. There was another scenario where it's literally just about acquiring artifacts. Another scenario where it's literally just about acquiring. I might, maybe I just missed the description was the fact, you know, we had to, I, I really like the, I was reading all the flavor. I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying maybe I missed it. Okay. That's what I'm saying. I, I like the mechanism about, uh, you flip over these cards every time you open a room and there's these very definite, uh, the features, the features that you put in your, it's that either going awesome. to so awesome. be a mirror or it's going to be an altar or it's going to be a well or a cage. And they're all very distinct and they all have different rules. If you're like, if you end your turn next to them, you get to do, you know, cool things. Right. And so you end up with a lot of cards on the table, but you only care about the feature that you end your turn next to, which again leads into how easy it is to adjudicate the quest turn. You just glance at the board. Oh, one of us is next to the garbage pile. This is what the garbage pile does. You do it, you move on. So in this particular quest, we had to do something beside beside the feature, and it did something. And I, I didn't have any connection to what we were doing. Oh, okay. So I had no idea what was going on, so I think it sort of pulled me out of the game. Okay, fair enough. That Then that's on me. One one final note that I'll make about Ultra Quest and just about the modular deck series systems of games, though, is I still have endless enthusiasm for Street Masters. I've played it about four dozen times now, and I'll gladly play it play it at the drop of a hat, especially at lower player counts, although Street Masters is less vulnerable to high player counts than, say, Ultra Quest is. I will still play uh, Street Masters with four players. I don't think I'll ever want to play Ultra Quest with four. But I wish, part of me wishes, and I don't think this is ever going to be possible, that there could be a Street Masters 2nd Edition that uses the same turn structure as, say, Ultra Quest and Hour of Need. Because in Street Masters, you have a move step, you have a card play step, and you have an action step. In Ultra Quest, you have three actions. And an action could be to draw a card, it could be to play a card, or it could be to move. So you can move three times, you can play three cards, whatever. And that flexibility just blows up the decision space and really, really makes you think about your available options and makes things so much easier. Also, just easier for players to process. I constantly have to read explain to people. It's like, no, 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 that was your action phase. You still get to play a card. Oh, no, 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 you've already played a card, so you can't play this other... Ugh. It's also really making me look forward to Hour of Need because Hour of Need also seems to have that level of scenario susceptibility where spe very specific and interesting things are happening in a deck-specific kind of way with minimal overhead, and it's about an hour long. So Hour of Need could just be the culmination of all these great design elements. So I think that Ultra Quest is borderline in terms of its game length, but very easy to manage in terms of uh, running the system and interesting in terms of how it exploits card combos. Very, very, very eager to see the final edition of Hour of Need. And I've been having a great time with AltaQuest. I'm probably still going to bust it out for some more solo sessions going forward. And if you're interested in trying it again, I would be more than happy to show it to you again. I definitely want to try some more characters. Oh, Horseman. Oh, Horseman. You're so beautiful and majestic. No, he's not. There's a guy with a he's horse for a head. Frightening and horrific. Yeah, I just, I don't know what it is. What, <laughs> and very uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, yes. Oof. Not down with Horseman. Other than that, I'm really liking Ultra Quest. All right, just a quick note on Gods Love Dinosaurs, designer Casper Lapp, put out by Pandasaurus Games. I think it's just like, a, I don't want to say a staple game, but I mean, it's just one of these games. I don't think, we have we ever even looked in the rule book? I don't think so. It's one of these games we can pull out in five years and just play it and and enjoy it. And it's a great game. So good. So good. Early game trade-offs, tension in the drafting about tempo and timing considerations. I want the rats to activate before the birds do, but I really want that tile that's under the birds column. Ah, oh, so good. Oh, yeah. We look down your board and say, I'm the only one that has a panther right now. I'm going to push those panthers. It's not a panther, Walker. For the millionth okay, time. It's a lion. I'm so sorry. It's not a lion. Either. You're trolling me. Yes. You're engaging in big cat trolling. <laughs> Anyway, so there's all sorts of decision making, all all sorts of ways to to push other people around. I love it. It's it's really great. It is the minor exception to my generalization that I'm going to prefer a tile layer where everyone's laying on the same tiles because the substantive interaction here comes from the tile draft. And the tile draft is so wonderfully managed in terms of these inc very agonizing decisions really that it's it's just great and managing your ecosystem is such a marvelous little puzzle. I always knew that I was close to divinity. And now I know, because I, too, love God's Love Dinosaurs. There you go. Not only did we play Yato, we didn't play Yato Master Set, but we played the Yato Deluxe Master Set. Ho, can, ho, ho. can I start with my story? Yeah, go ahead. When the first Yato was released, and I tried it, I hated it. I rated it a three on Board Game Geek. And for only the second time in my life, this was before I was a critic. I'm a nobody now, but I was even more of a nobody before. 
the designer geek mailed me to give me shade about my rating and my comment. It was really weird. Anyway, what did you think of Yato Deluxe Master Set? It, it did a great job in putting all sorts of things in your way of having fun. <laughs> it had like all sorts of different weapons and you had to make sure you had the exact ones you needed, but you had no idea which ones you would really need. And once you needed them, then you didn't need them anymore. And the core, it's like the core systems were designed with, by somebody with sort of the, 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 the broad perspective of a Vital Lacerda or of a Martin Wallace or possibly of the Splatter Gang, where it's like, okay, we're going to have a series of very particular things and very particular requirements you're going to have to do in order to get anywhere of substance. And we're going to have a very, very, and this, this reminds me too of Wallace a little bit, and of Lacerda, less so of Splatter, we're going to have a very, very intricate, detailed turn structure where very specific things happen at very specific times. And then on top of that, what we're going to do is have crazy cards that do all kinds of wild stuff. And that's where I get off the train hardcore. I'm willing to play a game with crazy cards that do lots of wild stuff. I'm also willing to play a very procedural, very narrow, very specific, very demanding Euro game. The two do not belong together. I don't know why Yato is as popular as it is. Because even the version that we played, and this is, the, this is one of the reasons why I was willing to give the Deluxe Master set a, a shot. Because instead of the original base game, where you just had the card sets and everything happened, here you could tailor your experience. And so I was deliberately keen to try the, this is your first game. You're not ready for the wild stuff yet. This is Baby's First Yado. So I was like, maybe Baby's First Yado will be sedate <laughs> enough in comparison. No, 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 no. Still nonsense. Now, different flavor of nonsense. We looked at some of the other cards, and it's not like, I play this card, you lose a turn. Or I play this card, I'm going to steal all the stuff that you pay, that you spent agonizing turns building up. Or I play this card, I'm going to destroy everything because I'm petulant. But it's still wild things like, oh, I spent a lot of time, money, and effort getting my extra worker, and now there's this event card that comes up, and everyone gets extra workers now. Okay, that's great. All right. Or or the worker place that lets me get an extra worker finally opened up, and I got my extra worker. Things are going to look great. Everybody lose a worker. Yeah. And this is to say nothing of the fact that, as you say, there are these very specific requirements. You need to be able to have a Geisha. You need to be have a, a weapon of this right kind. But there are a whole bunch of cards that could nuke the possibility of getting those things. And it's not regarded as harsh player interaction because, it, well, nominally it affects everybody. But guess what? Different players' situations will be ne more negatively affected by such things than others. And the weapon supply is entirely random. You can, the best you can do is to try to search through the, look, look at the next three that are going to be pulled. But if you need a specific weapon and it doesn't, doesn't come up, well then, guess what? You're not going to be able to do that thing. And yes, there are other things that you could go do. But at the end of the day, the calibration of, of randomness and arbitrariness in the Yato Deluxe Master Set is still way too high for my tastes. And especially given that it is an excess of two hour worker placement game. I like the auction system. The auction system's cute and clever and I really like it. And I'd like it even more if it weren't entirely undercut by random events that might just give you the thing you overbid for, for free. And there's no way to anticipate that. But, all, and there's the, the end game goal cards. It's like one of these other things where you can just fall into the exact card that you needed at the last turn of the last game. Ugh. Yeah, we had a situation where in the last round of the game, I played a nonsense action card in the great vein of nonsense action cards to try to draft from missions. And immediately after I pulled these missions, because at heart, Yedo is about satisfying missions with very, very specific requirements. After looking at the missions, I suddenly realized, wait a minute, what if I accidentally hand a mission to somebody and they just happen to have all the necessary requirements and they're just going to fall into vast sums of points? And I had to look very carefully to make sure that I was the one falling randomly into vast sums of points and not other people falling into vast sums of points. You were how many dollars off one, from just one dollar, one dollar off from randomly being able to succeed at the hardest mission in the game that just fell into your lap. Yes. And that's Yato Deluxe Master Set. And you won't hear about it again. I can almost guarantee it. Yeah, it was uh, it was probably the worst heavy Euro I've played in a long time. Definitely worse than on Mars, and I really didn't like on Mars. Yeah, it was like just arbitrary block blocking, and and then they had the the guard that just went around and just blocked off areas for. It was just weird. Yes, things put in your way for no. Anyway, let's let's move to a game that was 
surprisingly very good court of miracles who designed this game vincent brigias and guillaume gautran i think is how you would pronounce them and it's put out by lumberjack studio there i can do that quite easily how about that lumberjack studio walker i never wanted to be a podcaster no i wanted to be a lumberjack did you leaping from tree to tree to tree leaping. <laughs> so in this game it's a great little area control game you're putting down these hidden markers you're pushing the the penniless king around the board you're getting all these cool interesting combos to go off like it's a i place here which lets me move my guy over to this side which you know uh initiates this conflict because i won this conflict i can now you know put a guy over here and it has all these little interesting interactions and i really like it it's a neat little game it's kind of sort of worker placement coupled with blind bidding you have all these workers that have a certain amount of strength and a location is controlled by whoever has the most strength in it, but you don't know what the strength of any of the other quote-unquote fighters are. And where you are in the position is the tiebreaker. And so suddenly you have these trade-offs about where you want to be. Well, I want to win this conflict, but I want to go into this action space, and that action space isn't going to help me win it. And there's also this other neighborhood constraint, because you get an action space that is coupled to a neighborhood bonus, and that might be determinative of where you need to go. You also have the option of upgrading your workers, and you literally dump your old workers into the Sen. So there's that. I mean, you're all criminals. You're all groups of criminals, and the theme is very unsavory, and they go into great detail about what horrible people you are. Uh, but the theming is really, really, really very, very paper thin. But it's, you know, being able to toss your dead workers out into the Sen is a nice little bit of flavor and helps underscore that you're a bunch of cut, pur- cut purses and rogues. And it lasts a perfect amount of time. Yeah, it was about 45 minutes to an hour with four players, and that was just about right. It's a worker placement game with some conflict, and there's fundamentally two resources in the game. There's money and there's cards, and that's about it. There's other things that are happening, but at the end of the day, it's not a very complicated economic system or, or, or weird things. Yeah, timing constraints, a little bit of sort of arbitrary or semi-arbitrary hosage, maybe some possibility for king-making. But again, hard to object too strongly when the game is that quick and that delightful. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was surprised by how much how good it was. Let's transition into a game that's not exactly similar, but it's almost exactly what we were just talking about. Nadavalier. Just do the fact that you're putting down hidden tokens and you're trying to have the highest one. So in this game, you're trying to build this vast, dwarven army and they score all sorts of different ways you know you get the purple one score one way the blue one so you're getting all these columns and they form up ranks and as you get as you get uh, ranks and all the different colors you start to get heroes and then the, the abilities start to go all crazy and i really enjoyed it mark Again, it was a blind bidding game i don't normally like blind bidding games but honestly it was a little bit less about sussing out what other people were going to bid and more about even managing your own economy because you have these five coins that you can upgrade your coins over the course of the game. A substantial amount of the game is trading off your different monetary accounts so as you can get better bid value. And there's a whole bunch of standard Euro scoring elements like these people score in a triangular way, these people score in a uh, weird multiplicative way. But against this tension of trying to specialize in certain colors, there are these wild heroes that give you lots of special powers, but you only get them by diversifying. And so a lot of the early game was this tension of trying to get the right sets together to get heroes, and that tension was really, really cool. I'm a little bit suspicious of how close the endgame scores were, because I was doing very, very poorly, and I ended up within about 5% of the winning score. I don't know whether that's an indication that I was doing better than I thought or an indication that it's the kind of Euro that sometimes happens where no matter how badly you do, you're probably going to come out okay. And uh, sometimes that's all right. Sometimes that isn't. Nedavalier was designed by Serge Laget and is what you might call an LFG or a little French game, very much like Court of Miracles. And I thought that for the amount of time investment involved, it was very, very, very successful. And I very much liked the artwork, despite the fact that it's about dwarves, and I really don't like dwarves, in fantasy contexts. Let me be very clear. Just They don't do it for me, I, thematically speaking. I didn't like the one I was thinking about earlier today. I didn't really like, we already talked about it, the one hero that you had picked up. Because a, oh, yeah. a big part of the game... She is obnoxious. A big part of the game is this trying to outguess what people are going to bid on. Because it's fairly obvious what cards people want. 
right? Because you, you want heroes because we're heroes are ridiculous. They're going to like, uh, they're a huge, uh, score multiplier. You can easily look over at someone's board and know what they're going to take and know which column they're going to bid on because they're going to want certain cards. And Mark got a hero where he can wait till everyone reveals their bid and then place his bid and seem to take that whole part out of the game. Well, we were only playing with three, which is definitely the lowest player count I'd want to play with. It's an auction game, and so generally speaking, more numbers are good. And I don't think that the time commitment would increase drastically, certainly not with four. The the part that I strongly objected to about the hero that I had, which was doubly bizarre, was in addition to not having to worry about the blind bidding element, I just see what everyone else's bids were after before I bid, it also changed the way my coin upgrading system worked. Normally, in order to upgrade a coin, you have to devote two coins to the coin upgrading process, and so you can't use either of them for this round. Well, specifically, the way this hero worked is it voided that. So not only did it void the blind bidding element, it voided the key economic element. And so I felt like I was playing a strange pseudo game of Nidavalier where all the restrictions didn't apply to me. Not only that, you got it right away. So not only did you not have to commit those two coins that you couldn't use for that whole turn, but when you did cash them in and get the higher one, you could have placed that. that, that, that that's exactly what I mean. There was a, there was a degree of, of, of egregious flexibility involved. But it's tough to tell. I mean, we don't really know how balanced... Like, a, a lot of the powers seem ridiculous. This one seems a little bit more laborious than a lot of the other abilities. You know, her description is two full paragraphs of text in a very, very light game, so I'm a little bit suspect in that sense. I still had a great time playing the Davalier, despite my misgivings, both about the final score and this hero. I would definitely... I'm, I'm not at the point where I'm going to house rule her yet, I would definitely want to play him another couple times to see what, what's going and see if there's any chatter on various fora. I, I could check uh, Trip Track to see if there's noise there about whether people object to this hero. But I really liked it. Yeah, there's a lot of cards that you like, uh, much much like other deck builders or other games like that. There's like uh, cards are numbered. So you're playing less players. You weed about a bunch of the cards out. I'm just wondering if they could have done that with some of the heroes. Like you're playing with less players and you play with less heroes. Maybe. But, of course, her value is lower the fewer players there are in the game. The more players there are in the game, the better it is to know exactly what you need to bid in order to win the card you want. But, yes, there, there's that. That it was the only clumsy bit of the rules explanation. You explain the rules. It takes about two minutes. This is how the bidding works. And it's like, okay, here's what all the heroes are. And the game, for what it's worth, despite the fact that it's a very small game and very, very inexpensive, it has a lovely cardboard coin stain so you can see all the available coins to upgrade to, which is very helpful so you can just look over and not be told, oh, the coin you want is gone, which actually is a good thing because then you go to the next level. And it also comes with plastic card stains just that just display all the available heroes, which was kind of neat. It was a nice touch. There was a lot charming about Nadavali. It was a very, very charming game. Yeah, looking forward to playing it again. Again, under the topic of very small, delightful games, we got to play Frenemy Pastry Party. We really did, Mark. <laughs> we really did. Frenemy Pastry Party is a game of passive-aggressive animal bakers who want to make cakes and also want credit for helping making other people's cakes, except for the times when they don't want their friends to make cakes and then refuse to help them. It is, and I mean this in, as, as very high praise, it is vaguely reminiscent of Tower of Babel, the Knizia game, where it's an area majority game where on top of that you're offering people help. And the goal is to make offers such that whether or not the person accepts or refuses, you end up winning. Front of Me Pastry Party doesn't really have that element. Instead, what happens is you basically draft cards one at a time. I'll take this blueberry. I'll take this mango. I'll take this piece of chocolate. I'll take this kiwi. And then eventually someone will be like, I want to bake this cake. That means three blueberries, two chocolate, a mango, and a kiwi. Everything needs seven cards. And you start asking your friends for help and they say well i'll give you a blueberry and they're like walker would you like to give me a blueberry too and walker will say no because i don't like you or your face and i'll be all right that's fine and you get to keep going this way until you get two no's and then you have to supplement with your own cards or you can stop at any time and long story short you get one point for every card you contribute towards someone else's cake five points for getting credit for baking a cake and i won by consistently baking cakes with three cards from one opponent and three cards from another opponent and paying one card for myself. So I got five points and my two friends got three points and I spent fewer cards. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> yes, you can game it out very quickly for sure. Well, it, no, I'm not saying that's the only way to win. I'm saying that those are the kinds of calculations you need to make. There's other things to consider as well, like the character special scoring. You get bonus points if you've contributed more towards another. And certainly at some point, some or both of you could have figured, no, I'm not helping you anymore. This is ridiculous. And there's the fact that 
buried in this calculation is that I was taking my turn to bake the cake, so you were getting three points off turn, as opposed to my getting five points on my turn. It's not that that, that is obviously straightforwardly the way to go, it's just those are the kind of calculations you need to make. It was a lovely, lovely, quick little card game, 30 minutes maybe, adorable artwork, big fan of Frenemy Pastry Party. On the subject of quick and painless card games, we got to play Marvel United. And much like we just said, it's very inoffensive, quick, easy, sold at Walmart card game. Great for, you know, the family, introducing people to, to board games. I'm glad that people are, get to play, you know, it's, this is on the shelf. So maybe people will pick it up instead of a Yahtzee or a, or a Scrabble and they'll get introduced to a more modern type design board game. I would want to try it again before issuing more of a judgment, which would probably be a, what, 15, 20-minute time commitment, perhaps. It didn't feel very superhero to me. I didn't feel like I was being a superhero. I didn't feel like I was doing anything particularly cool. And so I don't know that it's using much in terms of the theme other than window dressing, which, you know, isn't a cardinal sin. And I'm not a huge fan of the Marvel Universe anyway. The figures were very cute, but the card play felt very simplistic to me. And not necessarily in a good way. In terms of very simple co-ops, I'd probably lean towards more something in the pandemic vein. As well, because the rate at which you are going to be punished by the game system seems pretty arbitrary. Like every every few turns, the villain plays the top card of their deck. And it I didn't get the sense that there were looming threats that I could see coming. It was just, oh, the villain happened to do something really terrible for us this turn. Versus, oh, we got lucky this time. So there didn't seem to be a whole lot of there there, even by the standards of a game of that length. But I'd be willing to try it again. As you say, it was inoffensive. It was hard to take anything very seriously. Yeah, I want to try the different bosses. I'm hoping that they have a little bit more intricate mechanics. And then there's the expansions. Like there's the the infinite Infinity Gauntlet. But who do you know that would be so generous as to pledge for such a thing so as to satisfy your idle curiosity? Some true friend, I'm sure. If only you had any of those. And that is Marvel United, designed by Andrea Caversio and Eric M. Lang. Put Dude. out by, come on, oh my, I can't believe it. Just no, no, Simon. We, Put out by Simon. We are United. a Simon podcast. And Spin Master. Do you know what else Andrea Caravasio has done? No. He has done the Kingsburg Games as well as Hyperborea. Oh. Yeah. Given such a stellar design pedigree, I was a little disappointed. <laughs> no, I don't David Hyperborea and Eric Lang, yeah. and they put out that. Yeah. Wow. Well, Eric Lang has done very, very light games before. This is very light. Anyway. <laughs> it is very light. Moving on. Let's talk about Eminent Domain. Eminent Domain. Yes. Why would we talk about that? Did we play that? We played Eminent Domain. We, I, I know we played it because it was two hours of my life that I'm never getting back. We played Eminent Domain. We streamed it. For those who don't know, we put a video up on YouTube if you wanted to check it out. It was a terrible... Not terrible. See what happened. There's a story. How about, how about I, I talk about the story? In the beginning. In the beginning, I saw that Board Game Arena had eminent domain. So I said, hey, why don't I play that? So I brought it up and there was a game about to start. So I sort of just like fell in and I looked at it and said, oh, you play these cards. They generate these symbols and you use these symbols to boost actions and the cards do what they do. And I just sort of, it was, I guess it was just sort of game that I just understood immediately and thought that I could easily explain it that way to, to other people. And that was a mistake. I remember a very wise individual not too long ago saying on this podcast that we should be tolerant of rules explainers. You should be forgiving of their errors you should be appreciative of the, of the effort that they put in and not be a, what's the technical term, tremendous colossal douchebag to them. And uh, I immediately forget about this because I am also, in addition to being a colossal tremendous douchebag, I am also a colossal tremendous hypocrite. So I was not kind to Walker, and I said some very, very mean things, despite the fact that he was there trying to help me have fun. So I'd like to apologize once again to Walker for having completely <laughs> gone back on my word. I stand by what I said the first time and not all the terrible insults that I hold at him in his face. Now... That having been said, halfway through the game, I figured out how it worked. I, my rules questions more or less went away about halfway through the game. And I hated Eminent Domain. I, really, I thought it was really, really awful. I really like Eminent Domain. In Eminent Domain, it is a... Do you know why it's called Eminent Domain, by the way? No. Okay, I'm going to design uh, a fantasy game or a science fiction game. I'm just going to start pulling random legal terms. I like force majeure or strict scrutiny or something like that. There we go. I'll design a dungeon crawler called strict scrutiny. And be like, why is it called that? Well, you have to 
scrutinize the treasure strictly or something like that. Anyway, go on. Anyway, it is a deck builder, and I, I agree with you that it's quite drab. Especially like the fact that you're drafting a card every turn and there's no even, there's no art on these cards that you're drafting every turn. There's a little bit of interesting art on the ones that you get to choose to buy. The one problem we had in the game, the fact that it was digital, I know I read the rules the one time, the fact that some of the cards are double sided. And I'd like to see how that worked in the physical form. So as in, if you reshuffle your deck, you know you're about to draw it because you can see the back of the card. The the double sided cards are all ones that go. Oh, that's right. They're, the per, they're only the permanent ones. Okay. Yes. So, anyways, there's some cards that are double sided, and and both sides are out. You get to choose when you buy it. So when it showed us up on the display, it showed two cards, and then someone would buy one, and suddenly the other one disappeared. So sure. That caused a little bit of confusion, even to me. But that being said, in eminent domain, you get to do an action, and then you get to do a roll. So the action, I would say, obliged to, but obliged go on. To. Yeah. So. The action will be listed on the card. You do the action. It'll let you, like, take over a planet or get some more ships or start putting out these trade tokens. Let you do something. And then the roll card will be an action that you can boost up with other cards in your hand. And everyone else at the table can follow your roll. So they have to have the same cards and they can boost it up as well. So it's kind of interesting. It lets you do things while it's other people's turns. lets you sort of maximize your, your deck. And the roll card, the roll that you decide to take, you actually take the card and it gets added to your deck. Where to start? I'm going to try to make sure that these comments are curated and somewhat to the point. This element of adding the card to your deck every time you do the roll actually means that your deck will be less interesting by the end of the game than it was at the beginning of the game. Because you're encouraged to hyper-specialize and keep doing the same of the incredibly boring action, which is my second criticism. Nothing you do is remotely interesting. You gather ships which then let you put out a planet. All the planets are basically the same. Very, very minor differences. You gather colony points so you can put out the same planets. Every once in a while, you get to put out a tech. And if you want to play well in eminent domain, you would best know the tech deck going in, and you'd better pay very, very close attention to whether or not someone else is satisfying the preconditions for, for the techs. Because in order to get the high-value techs, you need to have just the right hand. But then if you get the just the right hand after somebody else got just the right hand, you're only going to have the crappy technology. So congratulations, you were wasting your time on that. That was me playing poorly. I'll fully admit that. But still didn't feel very satisfying. Compare this to its two obvious influences, Glory to Rome and Race for the Galaxy. And granted, comparing any game to Race for the Galaxy is often apt to lead to disappointment because it's one of the greatest tableau builders ever. It's certainly my favorite tableau builder. In Glory to Rome, you care about what everyone else is doing. The buildings are fun. All the buildings get to do fun things. And so, yes, it's a multi-step process of putting out a building. But at the end of it, you have something neat. In Eminent Domain, it's a multi-step process to put out another boring planet. Yay! And you'll just be doing the same actions, these incredibly dull, banal actions over and over and over again. And you're not even really encouraged to kind of draft off what other people are doing. At the start of the game, I had no colonization cards. And two other people at the table did. And so they were colonizing all the time. And I started thinking, maybe what I should do is work towards getting into the colonization game. And then I could draft off what they're doing. But every time I started my weak colonization efforts, they would be drafting well off of my weak colonization efforts. They already had a built-in advantage. And the way the card symbols work, it's not in my interest to waste some turns to try to give them the benefit just so I can get in on this other kind of dull action. It was incredibly monotonous and very unsatisfying and very reminiscent of two vastly superior games. I have negative desire to play Eminent Domain ever again. It was probably the worst thing I've played all year. And that's Eminent Domain. It's got tons of expansions. It definitely is much lighter than I thought it was. It was a game that did quite well, you know, had some buzz back in the day, and I thought it was a much more in-depth sort of 4 x type game, so... But I find it as an interesting deck builder, and still, I'm in the middle of about three different games as we speak. And those are the games we played this week. Now, on to the single news story and why it does matter. It is Board Game Arena. We were just talking about Board Game Arena. We were. They're doing something very interesting and, and exciting. Starting today, for those who are listening to the the podcast the day it comes out, December 1st, 2020. They're going to put, be putting out a game every day for the next 31 days. So that's 31 new games on Board Game Arena. I'm sure they're not all going to be, you know... They can't all be winners. They're not all going to be winners. They're not all going to be gems. 
but I'm sure there's going to be an, uh, a rare sapphire in there or two, and I'm getting interested to see what they're uh, what's coming out. Yes, it's called the Board Game Arena Opus Magnum, and I too am interested. I think it's a great publicity stunt. They've already released one Hex Encounter War game in the form of Unconditional Surrender. That was a while ago. I'm hoping that they're going to use this incredible release schedule to try to diversify a little bit. I've got no problem with Euros, but a few more war games would be very, very nice. And hey, maybe if I'm super lucky, they'll release some of the expansions for Eminent Domain. It may be. Only if you're lucky, Mark. Yeah. Maybe it will be a truly gorgeous Christmas after all. (laughs) And that's all the news and why it doesn't matter. On to our topic this week, which is Dungeon Crawlers. And I have to say, Walker, this as a categorization of game has really thrown me for a loop, because normally I think the categorizations aren't just a verbal trick. They're not just about a particular combination of the words. For example, when we talked about worker placement, you could define anything as a worker and say, oh, well, I'm placing this here. This means it's a worker placement game. And then, every, then anything can be a worker placement game. But I found myself, when reflecting on what I consider to be a dungeon crawler to be, and this is just personal intuitions about what a dungeon crawler is, I found myself resting on very particular definitions. Like, well, this can't be a dungeon crawler. You're not in dungeons all the time. And so I was looking at other people's definitions and the categorizations as it's expressed on Board Game Geek. And now I personally am confused about what a, what should be called a dungeon crawler and what shouldn't be called a dungeon crawler. Which is why I'm very curious to hear what you think a dungeon crawler is. I had the same misgivings and or questions, and I have it right there. The very first thing, does it have to be in a dungeon? Does it have to be fantasy? Uh, my, I think my, if I'm going to go into what my definitions are, it has to have a very compelling story. It has to be uh, something that engages you and gives you some sort of invested interest, right? Uh, a sense of ownership, right? That lets you care about this character. So there has to be some sort of leveling up, right? Some sort of constant danger. The fact that you don't want them to die. It can't be this, this constant, well, oh, it died. I'm just going to respawn somewhere else. There has to be like some, for some penalty going forward and some, you know, like not, I don't want to say legacy elements, but the actions that you do are going to have ramifications, you know, in the future. Right, some sort of thematic buy-in. Exactly. Well, let's start there, because that honestly throws me for a loop, because what I have actually, in, in terms of reflecting on Dungeon Crawler, is that most of them tend to have very bad themes. Because the paradigmatic Dungeon Crawler is evocative of what we could call bad D&D. Kick down the door, murder everything on the other side, take their stuff. Right? The kind of thing that Munchkin is making fun of. Munchkin isn't a dungeon crawler, I think we could... Actually, no, I'm not sure that we could agree that Munchkin's not a dungeon crawler, but it's definitely playing on those tropes. But you... So I was surprised when talking about Ultra Quest. They were like, unlike other dungeon crawlers, I don't really feel that there's much of a narrative buy-in here. Because I, I just don't have that association with dungeon crawlers. I actually find that for most dungeon crawlers, the theme is is some combination of absent or dumb. Could you, could you talk to me? Okay, then then talk to me about a dungeon crawler. No, that you, think, that, that, that will, you don't have an example. Be, I have tons of examples, but you won't agree with any of them. Like, I, I, okay, well, Imperial, just talk- I'm saying I love Imperial Assault. Okay, I think it may be one of those things where you where maybe people just know about the world more and sort of sure. they, they see what's going on and they can, for someone who likes Star Wars, yeah, yeah. For someone who likes Star Wars can see you know the not only what's going on in their little story or down this alley, but they have a sense of the whole world that's going on around Sure. Them. And I'm not going to fight you on this because, again, I don't know. I'm not confident about any of this. But Imperial Assault is neither fantasy nor does it involve dungeons. It doesn't even involve something like a dungeon. Most of the time it's overland stuff or hey, look, a series put, of sci-fi. You, you put map tiles down, Mark, and they have squares. I know. but And, that... and, and there's doors. Sure. <laughs> and when you kick open the door... You populate it with guys you want to kill. <laughs> okay, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but in terms of in terms of the literal combination of words, yes, dungeon crawler, you're zero for two, right? It's true, but you don't actually crawl in the dungeon either. So, <laughs> so <laughs> touche, touche. You're absolutely right. See, this is why you're good to have around. You give me those those important sanity checks. Okay, can you think? So I, I fully grant you, if you're invested in the Star Wars universe, absolutely Imperial Assault has a lot of narrative buy-in. If you play as the campaign, I'm sure even then on top of that, you have more narrative buy-in in terms of the character you're playing. Can you think of a sort of slightly more traditional stereotypical dungeon crawl that has a sort of narrative hook where you really feel invested in the goings-on narratively? Well, the Descent 2nd Edition with the app has some interesting stuff. I, I think I should play it more solo now. I, sh- I really should just pull it off the shelf. I have it. I have the app because they have these lieutenants that you can input into the system. Say I have this lieutenant and the little bit that I did buy, uh, sorry, the little bit that I did play 
would have this one of these lieutenants or big boss come in and he has this like little story and he you know jabs your party and he keeps fading in and out of your campaign and so it's that kind of thing that i love really i've played both versions of descent i've played it both co-op and 1v all in the context of second edition and i struggle to remember any quality quality narrative hook in anything that ever transpired there it's the most generic most bog standard stuff that I like. I hate the what's the name of the setting again? Terranoff. Terranoff. I hate the Terranoff setting, and I don't think they did anything interesting with it. But maybe we just played different scenarios. Because for me, the paradigmatic dungeon crawler, in terms of uh, both in terms of historical origins and in terms of the, the sort of setting and, and and backdrop, is the dungeon game. Sorry, dungeon with an exclamation point. Which is literally just wander around, kick down doors, and kill things. And it's almost a parody of itself at the point, because it's a parody of what bad role-playing looks like, or at least bad D&D. I, I shouldn't say that. People role-play for all kinds of reasons, and I shouldn't crap over people who play D&D that way. It's just not what I want out of a role-playing experience, partially because I play board games to murder things. If I want to play a role-playing game, I'm going to do it to tell a story rather than, than, than kill things. When I think of, in terms of, not that I was even thinking about these things in terms of these things, the, the, the dungeon crawl, which again isn't, in a lot of ways isn't really a dungeon crawl, which has the biggest narrative hook for me is claustrophobia. Because the setting is so, is, is so neat, and Croc has such a weird sense of humor, and the fact that it's got this weird sort of pseudo crusades kind of vibe, and at the same time he's constantly poking fun of the church. Which, Regardless of your religious proclivities, there's at least some thought going on there. There's some details. There's some texture. And it's not your bog standard sort of, this is your dwarven warrior. This is your elven archer. This is the priest, etc., etc. Even the priest is not even your standard priest. But past that, looking over the dungeon crawlers that I've played and the ones that I can think of, most of the ones that have any sort of, of quality to them are mostly just making fun of all this stuff. It's true. And I think that's what it all breaks down to. I have this at the end is that they're just trying to make the, a D and D experience, but take less time with, you know, less rules overhead mm -hmm. and a little bit more locked down on the rules. I mean, a little less play, you know, so, you know, there's not all this like crazy, you know, do whatever you want, wherever you want, just a little more confined space. Of course. Something that makes a little more sense. More like a board game. Yes. Playing to the strengths of a board game rather than the strengths of a role playing game. Exactly. Yeah, and it, it, it's less strange, actually. I've commented on this before. Before Descent First Edition, there really weren't a whole lot of hobbyist dungeon crawls of much quality. In fact, for a long time, my favorite one, and I know you have some enthusiasm for this game too, is Mage Knight Dungeons, which did the competitive dungeon crawl thing rather well because you, as you started losing heroes, you could start using your activations to start activating monsters. And that was a great way to harass and harry your opponent. And these great 3D dungeon tiles, and the party building was at least mildly interesting. And, and traps, and the all trap, sorts of... Lots of traps. If anything, maybe too many traps. <laughs> and a lot of really good pre-painted stuff. Not the figures. The figures were hideous. But the uh, furniture and the yeah. artifacts and everything, those were really quality pieces, especially considering how old they were. And I've, I've, I've still have a soft spot for Mage Knight Dungeons for all, uh, for all its flaws. And I'm, wonder, I'm, I'm thinking that it's a very popular genre, I think. And that's why there's always something, if not one, three going on on Kickstarter constantly. And Well, it's very well suited for Kickstarter because they tend to be minis heavy. That's what I would say. And, and so do, do dungeon crawlers have to have buckets of plastic? Are they going to be tokens only? You know, have you played a successful dungeon crawler that is only tokens? Well, let's let's start getting into a bit of uh, of 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 a lightning round about whether or not you think these things are dungeon crawlers. Because I have my weak intuitions, and you might have your weak intuitions. All right, let's start with an easy case because I, I think I have a pretty strong th uh, thing about this. Space Hulk. No, really? No, Why not? Because well, no, actually, well, if you go deep, deep into it, because they have a whole uh, narrative campaign that you can go through. That again, you can, you go back to this that narrative you can, emphasis that you can sort of upgrade your. So was dungeon team. was dungeon not a dungeon crawler then because it didn't have a narrative element? Well, I don't, I didn't, I can't, I don't remember okay. enough of it to to tell you. What, what about Descent First Edition? Was Descent First Edition not a dungeon crawl because it didn't have any narrative fluff attached to it? Past just here's turn off, here's some people go kill something. No, it had tons of story. <laughs> How about this one? Would you say that uh, Xeno Shift was a dungeon crawl? No, no, why no. not? <laughs> wow! <laughs> well, you have hordes of guys. You get to sure. Up, you get to. Upgrade. There's a high body count. Yes, you get to upgrade. There's a story. You get to. I don't know. It's something I thought of. There's today. no story in Xeno Shift. There's no story worth comment. You are running a facility, and there are aliens trying to kill you. That's not a story. 
a little bit. Wow. So, so you're. I'm not saying it is, Mark. Okay. I'm not saying it is. I'm so, just saying well, that see- it has tropes of a dungeon crawly type thing where there's there, you, you're sort of kicking down the door and you're killing tons of guys and you get to upgrade. You have invested interest. Well, on, strictly in your speaking, you're not even kicking down any doors. No, it's, but- it's 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 more of a tower defense in that there are these waves of things coming at you. It is, that is specifically true. Yes. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So, so I guess for, by your estimation, claustrophobia isn't a dungeon crawler either. No, I was thinking about that when you said it. And you don't upgrade your people. You start off as strong as you're going to get. This is going to be a recurring thing because I don't think in-game upgrades are a requirement for a dungeon crawl at all. No, and and the other dungeon crawls that I would I'd lean harder into that are dungeon crawls. You don't you don't have a locked way to go. There's different. Uh, quest, you know, I mean, depending on what, if you go some back, degree of exploration, or yeah, some degree if of... you go left or right, and you don't always have to double back. Whereas close to phobia, you definitely have to find a specific map piece, and you have to go a, a certain way. It depends on the scenario. Yeah, well, yeah, depends the ones that I've played so far. I, I don't remember them all specifically, but whereas in I'm not so I haven't done too much of the new descent, but the old descent definitely you could go in different directions, and sometimes you know you didn't have to double back or or stuff like that. Huh. But I think in Imperial Salt, it was all a set map, and you definitely had to explore the whole thing. There was a couple times where where it would change the outcome, depending on, you know, you had to find a certain key card, and if you kicked open this door first, then other things would happen. It'd be an interesting way to change up the story, but you pretty well had the whole map set out, and you'd, you'd be using the whole thing. Okay, so what about other sci-fi stuff? What about Gears of War? Did you play the Gears of War board game? Yep, for sure. Is I, it a dungeon crawl? I would say no. Why not? You have your set guy, and he does what he does. And okay, so you're, again, you're coming back to the upgrades thing. If you can't upgrade your character, then it's not a dungeon crawl. That, or at least that, that weakens its claim that, to be a dungeon And that's crawl. another huge thing where I, I must have missed that. There's, it's got to be the loot. <laughs> you got to be the loots. It's got to be the big bad loots. You know, well, there, there are loots in, there in is, Gears of War. You find new Gears, guns, you find new Gears ammo, War, you find grenades. Yeah, 100%. I'm saying you open up that chest and you get the, you know, the thing that gets you the extra dice and you upgrade, you know, you get better armor and you slowly get, you know, better stuff. Okay. What about level seven Omega Protocol? Yes, I would say that was. You upgrade your character less in level seven than you do in Gears of War. You do, but it it could be, a, uh, I don't know what it is. Okay. It's interesting. Sure, I definitely agree with you that for categorizations like this, we're both very much in the we know it when we see it, and I'm just wondering if there if if, if we can tease out. To my mind, there's a there's a, a a level of customization too in level seven where Gears of War. Yeah, but it's all front loaded. It is, but I'm just, but you get to pick what character you have, and you get to pick your skills, and you yeah. get to pick your your starting loadout, right? Right. But where in Gears of War, you just sort of pick that guy, and then off you go and type thing. Isn't that true in Descent as well? Yeah, but it changes awfully quickly. You know, you're finding weapons and you're upgrading almost immediately. Okay. Well, then what about Ultra Quest? Ultra Quest, you don't do any upgrading, really. Yeah, that's what, that's, well, that's what was one of my things. There's definitely no, I'm, there is a campaign system. We took yes, some there is a campaign system. That had, so I don't know how that works. I don't want to comment on it. There was definitely not a very much sense of loot. There was, you know, you did search those things, but it was always just potions. I didn't see anything. Yeah, it was that, just a series of one shots. Most, for the most part, there are some exceptions. It didn't seem very, anything very exciting at all. So that was another, another quip I had with it. Huh. This is fascinating. So Hellboy would definitely not be a dungeon crawl because you don't upgrade anybody in Hellboy. You start off with your skills. Uh, some people have listed Mansions of Madness as a dungeon crawl. There I definitely got off board because I think both yeah. thematically and in terms of the lack of, of, of upgrades, you're doing something very different. Especially since in Mansions of Madness, there there's it seems to be more focused on investigating something rather than you know so much with the murder. Uh, in fact, in many scenarios, you cannot kill the thing that's chasing you. Uh, what about overland adventure stuff, like Assault on Doom Rock or Too Many Bones? Maybe. I'm, I had another thought while you were talking about that. What if it, What if you? What if it's a game where it leans a little heavier into into D and D, where you're actually you're asked to act like the character that you're playing on the board, like you you're given options in the game sometimes to do. You know, do you kill this thing or do you not do? You know, where there's some a little bit of light role, yeah, play? where there's a little bit of morality questions. You know, does that make it a dungeon crawl, right? Where it, where it says, you know, do you rescue the princess or do you go for the gold or type thing? You know, I'm wondering if that is what makes it a dungeon crawl. Well, it depends not. if you're trying to replicate old school bad D and D. Any degree of moral complexity. 
or narrative ambiguity would definitely move you further away from that source material. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't necessarily know. I mean, I mean, cause let's be frank, your stereotypical fantasy dungeon already is already ridiculous and absurd. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And the moment you start wondering about even the ecology or why these things are just chilling out of this dungeon, who built this dungeon and why, and what's going on here. And how would they eat? Yeah, how would you, how would you undertow or too many bones, too many bones. What would you designate that as? Cause you're not, you're never moving around a dungeon. It's very abstract, but you, right. But it does have the story, the story, you know, the story cards, and it has a very, you know, in depth. See, if I were forced to offer a definition, and definitely has upgrades. Yes, you absolutely upgrade your character. Well, they call it a a dice builder RPG, which is just a mash of words that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If I were forced to come up with a definition, and this is admittedly this is weak, of what a dice of what a dungeon crawler is, I would say that your stereotypical dungeon crawler is a subset of your combat heavy adventure game, where usually you're working through some kind of facility, where movement is generally, though not necessarily, a little less abstract than what you might find in something like Too Many Bones. Now, again, this is a weak definition. And I'm not particularly married to it being fantasy. And for whatever reason, I don't have the same assumption that you do that it needs to have some degree of character upgrade. So I'm perfectly comfortable with claustrophobia being a dungeon crawl. I'm perfectly comfortable with Space Hulk being a dungeon crawl because they are combat-heavy adventure games with some sense of of space. Plus, on the box of Space Hulk, it says it's a 3D role-playing game. So, <laughs> so it, it must be. Uh, that's a solid point. I hadn't considered it in in that sense. I will say, though, that other than these two-player games, like Clusterobia and Space Hulk, I am very glad that the overwhelming majority, if not all of the dungeon crawls lately, have been co-op. Because doing in, in, injecting competition into these kinds of games is usually very fraught. Again, Mage Knight Dungeons did an okay job of it. But neither of us are a particularly huge fan of 1v all games. And usually you just end up with something along the lines of Munchkin or Cutthroat Caverns, which again are, are, are riffing on, I wouldn't call either of those a dungeon crawl for not any good reason that I could defend at this point. But it's just encouraging the kind of sniping that you would see at a degenerate session of, of D&D where everyone's at each other's throats. This is one of the reasons actually why I want to try a game called uh, Doppelganger, which is the social deduction game version of D&D, where someone actually is a doppelganger. And so you're trying to, you're nominally going and doing fantasy adventuring, but at the same time trying to figure out who the, who the doppelganger is. Never got a chance to try it. Apparently it's mediocre, but I still want to try it. So I'm, as I say, I'm glad that co-op is now de rigueur. And of course, we've gone this far without mentioning... Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, there's no. That's what I'm wondering. There's no sense, you know, if you're if you want one of these games, then get Gloomhaven. <laughs> yeah, I agree entirely. <laughs> Even though, again, for me, Gloomhaven isn't really about the narrative. There is there is enough narrative there, so it would satisfy your your criterion of of it having some some degree of narrative hook. I was never really in it for the story. I was in it for the 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 the, the card combinatorics and the crunchy advancement stuff. You know, I will say though that even the more modern dungeon crawls. Whether you consider level seven a mega protocol to qualify, whether you even want to quibble about Ultra Quest or things like that, length is often an issue with some of these games. Usually the longer ones, Descent First Edition was atrociously overlong, yeah. like four hours easily. Yeah, and, and this whole genre has quickly come from a one V all into, you know, all co op, right? Because, you know, Descent, they quickly, you know, put in a mechanism that would someone would run the Overlord and then they put in this app and then and then now all the games that are coming out the overlord or or bad team is always being run there is an or an exce- you know there are rare exceptions but more than likely you know it's being run by the game somehow absolutely and honestly sometimes i'm i enjoy a dungeon crawler if it's just to the point and really really stupid and that's kind of why i enjoy massive darkness you know massive darkness is my is is and i'm looking forward to the second edition seeing what that looks like uh, nothing to write home about but good for some dumb fun uh, unlike something like Claustrophobia, which I think is, you know, legitimately an excellent two-player tactical game. Again, whether or not you think it's it's a, a dungeon crawler. And I also like some of the sort of... I, I don't like Cutthroat Caverns or Munchkin, but I do like some of the games that are riffing on the standard dungeon crawl. Like One Deck Dungeon is a really solid solo uh, dice game by Asmati Games. And I really did enjoy Escape the Dark Sector, which is riffing on the kind of 
that kind of thing in that it's choice light, but giving you just enough narrative to hang on to things. I don't know if you'd be willing to accept the Escape the Dark Sector version because it's sci-fi or whether you would insist on the Escape the Dark Castle version because it's it's fantasy. But again, that's just quibbling about details. <laughs> I wouldn't mind either. I, I think <laughs> I like the, fa- the, the science fiction. Well, no, just in terms of classifying it as a dungeon crawl oh, or see. not. No, I don't think... I don't think, like I said, Imperial Assault is just as much as a, a, a dungeon crawler as Descent is. So. Fair enough. All right, well, that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>